Good morning. We've heard from some incredible speakers this morning, and I always love uh, hearing Peter and Andreas talk about the opportunities and the challenges with Bitcoin and blockchain and digital currency. Uh, and so what I wanted to do was actually uh, take a step back uh, and just kind of do Bitcoin 101. Make sure we understand the history of where it came from, how it works, why it's important, and then talk about why the MIT Media Lab is so excited about this opportunity. And Joey Ito, who's the head of the MIT Media Lab, has described it as one of the most transformative technologies in the next decade. So let's start in the fall of 2008. Some of the things that hit the headlines of the newspapers in the US and around the world was the election of Barack Obama as President of the United States, and at the same time, Wall Street crashing. But what wasn't making headlines at that same time was the release of a white paper from Satoshi Nakamoto, who may be a person, may be a group of people, unclear. But what's important to know is that this paper that was written, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, enabled a breakthrough that had never happened before. If you think about it, you look at the title, it kind of seems like it's not that important. We have PayPal, or you have online banking, so what's the big deal about this peer-to-peer uh, -peer electronic cash system? And then you realize, oh wait, it's peer-to-peer. -peer. And what does that enable? Well, let's take a step back. What's something that we do every day on our phones? We take images, right? Take photos, send them to a friend if they're good, delete them if they're not, put them on Instagram, put them on Facebook, and you start to replicate them at very little cost. You start to get likes, and you share it around the world. I was in Japan yesterday, took a, took a picture of uh, Joey when we were at this event, sent it to him in the, in the morning, so it could, and it would start to get replicated. And that's the beauty of digital, right? That you can take these images and automatically recreate them and, and share them anywhere at almost no cost. So let's take a dollar. Let's put it on our phone. Let's send it to three people, and then we've created three dollars, right? No, that's not how it works, right? So what Bitcoin and digital currencies do is if I have a uh, dollar and I give you a dollar, it doesn't allow me to keep that dollar, which is an important distinction. So it eliminates the double spend. And that's the, the innovation that happened with that Bitcoin white paper, is that all of a sudden, digital assets um, have uh, ownership, and you can transfer the ownership. So if you think about Bitcoin digital currency, it's really the transfer of the ownership of assets digitally without a bank or other third party. But as we know, it's not just about money. It can be sports tickets, right? So you can go online, you can buy a ticket to a concert or a sporting event, you can download the PDF, then all of a sudden you can't go to that concert or that event anymore, and so you want to resell it. You can go on Craigslist, you can try and sell that item, but what will happen is you could maybe sell it to five people, maybe sell it to ten people, and all of a sudden you have fraud. Because only the first person to get there that scans that barcode will actually get in. But on the blockchain, you could actually take that ticket, sell it to someone else, and actually have proof that you no longer have ownership of that ticket. And the person that you sold it to now has ownership of that ticket. But it doesn't stop with concert tickets. You can do houses as well, property title. So the scale can go from a penny to your house. And how is this made possible? Well, as Peter described, there's a blockchain or a public ledger. And what it is is just uh, debits and credits that will take, uh, that will, that's public and can be shared around the world and is shared around the world um, so that you have this decentralized system. And what that creates is decentralized trust, which we've never really had before. What that allows for is you, who I've never met before, I can give you a dollar we can transact online without not having met in person. Because before, if I wanted to give you a dollar, I'd actually have to give it to you in person. But there's no third party intermediary. And so what it does is it eliminates intermediaries. Well, why is that important? 
will intermediaries charge transaction fees? Right, today in 2015, I used to live in Nicaragua. I lived in Nicaragua for seven years. Today in 2015, I still can't use PayPal to send money to my friends down there, but I can send them Bitcoin instantly. So let me talk about why it's not just um, about money and how it's, how, how, you know, Andreas touched upon something that was really important that, uh, you know, email was the first killer app, right, of the internet. That was before we had Google, before we had Amazon. So we had the internet, which is TCP IP, and then on top of that, we created other protocols. So we had HTTP, so you could do web browsing. We had FTP, so you could upload and download files. And then we had SMTP, so you could send emails, right? And why is that important? Well, and everyone says, well, why is this decentralized you know, system important? You know, we have banks, and they work OK for me. Well, what's important is when we started out with the internet, and we started out with email, you have these magical three words, you've got mail. But you've got mail only from other AO people on AOL. It wasn't until we had SMTP that we could start sending emails to other people on Hotmail, on CompuServe, on Gmail, et cetera. And that was important. And so if you look at the public ledger or blockchain and you see what's being built on top of that, you've got money, right? So you've got Bitcoin. But they're also putting identity. They're putting reputation. They're putting marketplace. And so these are new protocols that are built out. And if you think about it for a second, and you think about who are some of the, the greatest intermediaries out there, that actually replicates their entire stack. Right? To me, I call that the eBay stack. Right? What's the eBay stack? The transfer of money, your identity as a buyer or a seller, your reputation as a buyer and seller, and then the marketplace of buyers and sellers. And so all of a sudden, what's happening is you have these open protocols, so you're no longer stuck on eBay so that you can transact with people outside of eBay. And if you think about it, <laughs> everyone talks about Uber and Airbnb and Lyft and these other marketplaces of being incredibly disruptive to the traditional industries. But what, uh, what will be interesting in the future is that if this open protocol actually disrupts the disruptors, because they're an intermediary as well. So what else does that allow? Well, for more than 5,000 years, civilizations around the world have been using stamps. In some countries, they use stamps to, um, uh, they're, they're made of wood. In some, they're made of stone. and others, they're made of rubber. But what they do is they authenticate that this document was approved by the government, or this document was signed by this company, et cetera. Um, you know, I had a, a, a friend, an entrepreneur in Mexico, who uh, in Mexico you have to uh, not only sign your name, but then you also have to put a stamp from your company to make sure that it's actually valid before you send it to the bank or open a bank account or something like that. And I had to do that in Nicaragua as well. And when he was leaving the country, security pulled him aside. And they said, sir, why are you leaving with your company stamp? But it's such a, a silly thing. It's kind of like authentication theater that these stamps hold so much power. And what can happen is you can actually start to authenticate these things digitally on the blockchain. So what I affectionately call it, this authentication theater, is rub the rubber stamp authentication protocol. So that you can start to uh, reduce identity theft and reduce forms of forgery. And so the MIT Digital Currency Initiative was started just nine or 10 weeks ago. It's very new. But there's three main areas that we want to work on. One is research. We want to look at the security, the stability, the scalability of this platform. We have some of the top professors in the world, who, uh, uh, like Ron Rivest, who was the R in RSA. We've got some of the top economists, like Simon Johnson, who's a former chief economist of, of the International Monetary Fund. So you not only hear from the people who are excited about Bitcoin, but you hear from some of the, the top researchers in cryptography and economics to look at these issues. We'll also be looking at social impact. There's a huge opportunity, as the previous speakers have talked about, for financial inclusion, but for other opportunities as well that I'll get into in a minute. And lastly, we need more people in Bitcoin. We don't just need the original Bitcoiners. We need more diversity. If this is truly going to have the impact that is projected onto it, we need to make sure that the people that are working on this 
represent you know, the diversity of the UK, the US, and, and the diversity of the world. So we'll be working on that as well. So let me talk about one of the, 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 the use cases that, that we get excited about. So this is Hernando de Soto in Juan Llanos. And what they're holding up is uh, 40, uh, I think 40 pieces of paper that each represent a transition of ownership of property. Now, for some of you who know who Hernando Soto is, he's a famed Peruvian economist who wrote the book Mystery of Capital. And his idea behind Mystery of Capital is why capitalism took off in countries like the United States was because most small business owners started their company by borrowing against the equity of their home. But what happens in Peru, or for example in Egypt, where 92% of people don't have formal property title, is that you get all this capital locked up and can't be used. So in, 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 uh, in Egypt, that represents more than $400 billion in capital that's unlocked. If we were to have property title, be able to go onto the blockchain. But what happens when you have a change of government? in a country that no longer respects the property titles that were issued. Well, if it's on the blockchain, you can't just have someone in the, in the back of a, of a government office use a rubber stamp to forge something to say that you never owned that property. We talk about identity theft. Yeah, I was talking to uh, Andreas last night about this, and you know, he, he had a, the way he explained it is, you know, there's, look, there's $14 billion in annual loss of physical theft each year in America. There's $24 billion in annual loss of identity theft. It's because we've been spending hundreds, thousands of years practicing protecting our property. However, we've only been you know, trying to protect our identity for a few years. And the blockchain can help start to address this by starting to protect the information. Right now, information is of value, right? I was someone who worked in the federal government, and I got the letter from the Office of Personnel Management that said, we're sorry to report, but your information has been hacked. So now they have my entire job application, my past addresses, my full name, my social security number, my birth date, my parents' names, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, the answer to every question that you need to reset my password for anything, for a bank, for my email, et cetera. But why is that important? Why is information valuable? Well, when you can start to give information that you, know, that you only need and authenticate that you are this person um, in a way by using the blockchain, all of a sudden, uh, that information of just knowing that information no longer becomes of value. Or financial inclusion. Uh, I was talking to a government who delivers social welfare. They deliver social welfare, um, and uh, how they distribute it is actually in physical cash. Because a large percentage of the population, 25% of the population who receives this cash, they don't live within 20 miles of an ATM. And so they actually put the cash in. They actually sometimes even put it in a canoe. And they get it out there. But it's not just one canoe. It's two canoes, because the insurance company that ensures the delivery of this money says that there can only be a certain amount of money that's being delivered in each of the uh, canoes. And so what happens is they end up spelling, spending more money on the delivery of the cash than the cash that's delivered. right? And that's why people get excited about mobile money. But what happens is, you know, we had a question earlier that said, well, how do we get people involved? Well, what happens when 25% of the country moves to mobile money, or what happens when they move to Bitcoin? then all of a sudden, all the entrepreneurs in this audience can start to build out the financial services for the people who haven't had access to that before. So here's a really interesting example. During the protests in Kiev, you had protesters who were really smart, but they didn't have, uh, they didn't have access to the donations they needed to continue their protests. So what they did is they took their QR code, which is just a representation of an address, kind of like an email address, so you could send money into their, uh, to their wallets. It started to go around and get viral on social media, and then the TV cameras started to pick it up as well. But what happened here is when your QR code goes viral and they, they believe in your cause, people start to donate money, and instantly they had $15,000 in their wallet that they could use. And so what we're seeing is, like the internet, with 
2.9 billion people online every day, sending emails, sending text messages, sending instant messages, we've seen communication exponentially increase. And what we're going to see with Bitcoin is that because it's this open interoperable platform as well, you'll see transactions exponentially increase because you'll no longer need intermediaries and we can start to do it one on one. And I think sometimes this is really hard to explain. It's really hard to explain in the United States. It's really hard to explain in the UK and other countries where we could go walk a, a hundred meters and go find an ATM, go pull out some money and we're good to go, right? Or you can walk into a coffee shop and you can use your credit card. But a few months ago, I was in Iraq. I was giving a technical workshop and at the end I decided to say, well, why not? Why don't I just give a, a little quick impromptu workshop on on Bitcoin, kind of see what the reaction was. I thought maybe five people would show up. As you can see in the picture, more than 30 people showed up to learn about Bitcoin. These aren't people with strong technical backgrounds, but they instantly started downloading wallets. I gave them a few dollars here and there. They instantly started sending money back and forth to each other, and they instantly came up with ideas that I never could have imagined. I think what's going to be exciting is we're going to see a lot of the innovations that come along in Bitcoin, not from the UK and the US, but from developing nations where the financial infrastructure isn't as strong, and this comes out of a deep need. And so we're excited to um, help promote this, help support the community, help do the research that's needed as this nascent emerging technology starts to grow. Um, and we're excited to, to work with you and, and start to address some of these social impact challenges as well. Um, so there's my email. Feel free to email me. I'd love to talk to you. Thanks so much.